Lynette, your outreach coordinator here at the Castle Museum. I'm going to tell you a few things uh, that are upcoming, and then I'll introduce our speaker. Just as a reminder, there are refreshments on the back table if you need it, and there is a restroom right out that back door if you need that at any point during uh, today's talk. Uh, okay, so what's upcoming? Well, we just opened our um, Growing Saginaw County Agriculture and Enterprise Exhibit, which will be open through November. Um, but we're just really celebrating the idea of growing things, which is partly we're kind of yay for our speaker today, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, but through all of July, we're going to have all of our speaker presentations still reflect growing in some sense. Um, so the next Lunch and Learn after this one, so July 11th, we're actually changing it up. And we're going to do a Grow and Tell. So it's going to be like grown up show and tell focused on gardening. Um, so you can come open mic style, share your stories. Maybe it's a memory of gardening or maybe it's something you're proud of right now and visual aids are welcome. So if you've grown something that looks delicious and you want to share samples, I am ready to eat them. So <laughs> um, then on July 20th for History After Hours, our evening series, um, Sam Engel from the, the Pines and Dow Gardens will come and talk about H.H. H. Dow and his horticulture efforts um, in the area, so that should be interesting. And then July 25th, we'll bring it back to Saginaw, and we're going to explore urban gardening um, with Salim Manin from Houghton Jones Neighborhood Association, where I don't know if you're aware, but they do have an urban gardening program. Um, that they've had for years. And then not related to that, but just as a plug, on July 22nd, we're going to have a little fun with history and have a 1940s USO themed Victory Bash party. That one is a ticketed event, so I do need you to register if you want to join us, but it will be from 7 to 9. And we have Saginaw Elite Big Band coming. You're encouraged to dress up in 1940s garb. We'll have some dancing, some games. Um, your ticket comes with some adult beverages, and the donut dollies will be here too. So it um, should be a lot of fun. So I hope you join us for all those things. Okay, so now, today, we welcome Bevan Cohen, who is an award-winning author, herbalist, and owner of Small House Farm. He's also host of a popular podcast, Seeds and Weeds. Love that title. Um, he's been offering workshops and lectures um, all is it across the country even, oh, yeah. or just like, yeah, ever. so I heard of him doing a workshop in Bay County, and I was like, I need to talk to that guy. Um, so a uh, prolific writer, his works have appeared in publications including Mother Earth News, Modern Farmer Magazine, and the Journal of Medicinal Plant Conservation. He's the author and editor of more than 10 books, some of which are on sale today. So I hope you will um, check that out. So please join me in welcoming Bev and Cohen today. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. How are you guys doing today? Good. Oh, good. Me too. I'm so excited to be here. What a beautiful day we got. Is this some incredible weather or what? Um, crazy. I've never been to the Castle Museum before. This is my first time. This place is awesome. Um, I wish that I would have come earlier so I would have had more time to explore. Um, I didn't realize what I was getting into, and once I started going through this, what a cool place you got here. This is very, very nice. Um, so we're going to talk about planting and planting the seed garden, so we're going to talk a lot about seed saving. Now, I got a lot of stuff that I'm going to say in the time that we have together. So if you've got pencil and paper to take notes, get it ready because you're going to take a lot of notes. If not, have no fear. You can dig out your cell phone, if you've got one, and take pictures of slides as we go along. I find that's a helpful way to save the information for later, right? So, this I'm going to go. Come on, technology. Here's your first slide. You can take a picture of this or write this down. This is the podcast uh, that Jen mentioned when she was introducing me. Um, and I'm going to leave that up while I tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, again, my name is Ben Cohen, and I'm from Small House Farm, which is a sustainable homestead project in Sanford, Michigan, so not even that far from here. Um, relatively close, you guys are like practically my neighbors. I travel all over the place to talk to people about plants, so this is like so close to home, uh, it's really, really nice. Um, I got up, I was able to do my morning chores before I came here, it was great. 
Um, so we're on a dead end dirt road across the street from 1,100 acres of forest where we're at. So we do a lot of foraging out there for our food and our medicine and all that sort of thing. Um, our property is about three and a half acres total. So that's the buildings, the woods, the whole thing is about three and a half acres. And we grow a lot of stuff in our small space. And one of the things that we grow the most is seeds. We grow an incredible amount of seeds, some of it for historical preservation, some of it for commercial sales. We sell seeds on our website. We uh, sell some seeds wholesale to some seed companies. Uh, Baker Creek Heirloom Seed is our largest account that we deal with. We sell some seeds to them. If you're familiar with Baker Creek, they are fantastic. They sell so many unique and interesting heirloom varieties, herbs and flowers and vegetables and just some wonderful stuff. And they produce this big catalog every year um, that's, I mean, it's, Remember the Sears catalog? We flipping through that. It's like that for seeds. There's just so much in there. Flipping through it and dreaming. It's beautiful, and it's got all these seed stories in it. Really, really nice stuff. But all oh, this thing's gonna drive me crazy. All right, we're just gonna do it the old-fashioned way. I am. Before we talk about seed saving, we gotta understand what a seed is, right? Webster's Dictionary would define a seed as the fertilized and ripened ovule of a flowering plant containing an embryo and capable of germination to produce a new plant. Accurate, certainly, right? Webster's Dictionary doesn't mess around. But seeds are so much more than this, okay? Seeds, not only do they grow the food that we need to continue our future, but they also connect us to our past. You can imagine, if you will, on every seed, the invisible fingerprints of countless generations of people that have grown those seeds before us, passed down from hand to hand for 10,000 years. People have been growing their own food for 10,000 years thousand years and it's only possible because they've been saving and sharing their seeds. Sometimes when I give these talks I'll bring an Almond Joy candy bar with me as a visual aid, a little prop, you know. Um, and I didn't bring one today. I've been trying to cut down on the candy bars because inevitably I eat them on the ride home. Um, but we're going to talk about it anyways because I think it creates a point. An Almond Joy candy bar is something that we see everywhere that we go, right? In gas stations, in party stores, convenience stores, grocery stores, they're practically everywhere. And what are the three main ingredients of the Almond Joy candy bar? Almonds, coconut, and chocolate. All three of those things are seeds, right? Now, I was given this demonstration at a school garden, and there was a young kid out front who raised his hand and said, oh, no, Mr. Cohen, you're wrong. The number one ingredient in the Almond Joy candy bar is high fructose corn syrup. And he's right. He's, it's true. Smart kid, right? Corn syrup comes from corn. Corn is a seed. The Almond Joy candy bar, this most mundane of objects, everywhere that we go, we can find one, is 95% seed. Without seed, it would not exist. So this is the big takeaway of the whole presentation. When you leave here today and you go about your business for the rest of the week, look at things from the point of view of seeds. And you'll see that seeds are in everything that we do. Our candy bars, like we just talked about. The clothes I'm wearing right now is cotton. And cotton is just the dispersal mechanism for a seed, right? The coffee I'm drinking in this cup, oh, thank goodness for those seeds, right? Seeds are in everything. If there were no people on this planet, seeds and the plants that they grow would thrive. But without seeds, we would immediately cease to exist. So, while Webster's Dictionary is technically accurate, we know that seeds are so much more than that. So let's talk about saving them. We're talking about saving seeds right now, even though most of our seed saving is going to take place in the fall, right? A lot of farms and gardens and folks like to hire me to come in the fall to do hands-on seed saving workshops, right? And that's when we tend to think about seed saving, is in the fall when we're bringing in our harvest and extracting the seeds. But to be successful seed savers in the fall, we need to think about seeds all year long. In January, when we're flipping through our Baker Creek seed catalog, and just dreaming about gardens to come, we need to be thinking about seed saving. When we're just planting our first seeds, when we're transplanting plants out to the garden, when we're out in our gardens right now, weeding and watering and watering and watering and watering, right? We need to be thinking about seed saving. To have a successful fall harvest, seed saving should always be top of mind. Here's some examples as to why. Spacing and timing. Now, if you're an experienced gardener, you get pretty good at knowing how much space this plant's going to take up in your garden, how long it's going to be there until you can harvest from it, sure. But when you're saving seeds, sometimes these plants are going to be in your garden much longer than they normally would be. Sometimes they're going to take up a lot more space than they normally would. Understanding that when we're planting and planting our gardens is going to make sure we're a lot more uh, happy, let's say, less complaining in the fall when things are happening that we weren't prepared for. Here's an example, lettuce. A lot of people grow lettuce. You grow a head of lettuce, what's it, this big? Leaf lettuce, romaine lettuce. It doesn't take up a lot of space in your garden, right? 
But when you let it go to seed, the plant's going to be this tall, this big around. And it's going to be in your garden for two months, sometimes even longer than it would be if you're just growing it to eat it. If you don't know that coming into it as a seed saver, boy, that can get frustrating real quick, right? Another thing that we want to consider is fruit maturity. Many of the things that we eat and enjoy, we harvest well before it's actually a mature plant. Lettuce is another great example of that. We eat lettuce before it's even flowered, let alone make seeds. What we're looking at here is a cucumber. Now, the variety is Boothby's Blonde. If you're writing things down, write that down. B-O-O-T-H-B-Y, Boothby. I've eaten 250 different varieties of cucumber in my life, and this is the best one I've ever had. Boothby's Blonde Cucumber. It's a thin-skinned yellow cucumber, just like this. It's got black spines on it. It is fantastic. It's great for fresh, pickling, anything you want to do with cucumber, it's a winner. Unless you want to save seeds from it, right? Think of a cucumber when you eat it. Those thin, translucent little seeds will grow nothing. You have to let these cucumbers mature. And they're big and ugly and wonky, and they got this thick, bitter skin, and they're miserable, but they're full of hard little seeds. So we got to let these cucumbers mature to get seeds out of them. This is a yellow cucumber, sure, but even a green cucumber will turn yellow when it ripens. A zucchini will turn orange when it ripens, right? Learning how to identify these signals of maturity, that's how we know when to get the good seeds out of these things. One of the things that we need to learn when we're out in the garden is why do plants exist? What do plants want to do? Plants only exist for one purpose, and that's to make seed. That's all they want to do to ensure the next generation of plants, right? That's all they care about. That's their, their, their prime driver. And the only reason that fruit exists in any form in all of nature, be it cucumbers, peppers, apples, doesn't matter, is as a dispersal mechanism, right? So animals, such as myself, will take these fruits and then disperse the seeds. That's the only reason fruit exists. We like to think fruit exists for us to eat it, but that's not the case. It's for us to do the plant's work for them. Interesting, right? So once we realize that that's the only reason that fruit exists and that's the only purpose that plants have is to make seeds, then we know that when we allow our cucumbers or any fruit to mature on the plant, that plant will stop making baby fruit, right? It's going to put all of its energy into maturing those seeds, which means your production is going to drop. That's something we need to plan for in advance. Otherwise, we're going to be very disappointed later. If we want to eat a lot of cucumbers, we have to leave some cucumbers behind to mature our production's going to drop. Now, you don't have to leave a lot behind. How many seeds are inside of a cucumber? About 250, actually. That's an, is a lot. That's a tremendous a lot of fruits behind to mature. Uh, sometimes I go to Indiana. There's a small farm conference down in Indiana. There's a lot of soybean farmers down there, and I like to go and give them a hard time. Um, it's like my hobby. Soybean farmers, they're seed farmers. Soybeans are seeds, right? But none of these guys are saving seeds. And there's a lot of politics and a lot of stuff going on as to why soybean farmers aren't saving their seeds. So we're not going to get into that. But I like to go and poke them a little bit and say, hey, why don't you try saving some seeds? You've got all the equipment to grow, harvest, process, and store seed. That's your job. Why aren't you saving any of it? Well, I was thinking about it one time. At the end of the day, these guys are all just businessmen, right? Everybody's just trying to make the money to pay the bills and do the thing. So I said, well, what if I just crunch some numbers and present these guys with some math? Maybe I can change their minds a little bit. So I'm going to share that math with you. And this math is based on soybeans. If you're familiar with soybeans in any way, you know that there's two to three beans in a pod. Typically two. Three is a good one. Okay? So that's that. Now, if you've ever grown green beans, you know there's what? Eight, 10, 12 seeds in a pod. So the math is totally in our favor here. But all the math I'm about to give you is based on the soybean. If you allow 2.5% of your soybean crop to be seeds... 2.5% will produce enough seed to reproduce 100% of your field. Okay, let's look at that in a different way. Let's say you've got 100 plants. What's 2.5% of 100? Two and a half. Two and a half. If you leave two and a half of your plants to be seed crops, they will make enough seed to grow the 100 plants again. Just two and a half. I'm not asking you to save a lot of seed. I'm not asking you to do a lot of work. Nature creates an incredible amount of seeds. And once we realize that, we know that seed saving is a very, very simple task. Once we learn to see when the seeds are ready and how to take them out. That's all we got to do. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Here's some uh, terms that we use to define our seeds. We're going to just touch on these really briefly so when I use these terms, you know what I mean. 
Uh, you can see the two that are in green are the most important. Open pollinated is the A number one most important thing we want to see. And the simplest definition botanically of an open pollinated plant is a plant when it is left to pollinate openly with the other plants around it will produce fruits that contain seeds that are true to the maternal form. What does that mean? I can predict what those seeds are going to grow. I grow Amish paste tomatoes. It's a wonderful open pollinated variety. I save the seeds from Amish paste tomatoes, I grow them next year, Amish paste tomatoes. That's what they produce, right? Simple stuff. Now the opposite of that is the hybrid. And we have a lot of hybrid fruits and vegetables here in the United States. And we don't have time to unpack all the pros and cons of that today. But from a seed saving point of view, it gets a little tricky. A hybrid is made when we take two plants of the same species, cross pollinate them with each other to create the new hybrid variety. All right, this is known as the F1, first generation. All right, now I save the seeds from the F1, first generation hybrid, plant them next year, they grow the F2, second generation, easy enough. In the F2, second generation is every potential genetic expression that could have come from the first initial cross. What does this mean? You do not know what those seeds are going to grow. They could be like the maternal plant, like the paternal plant. They could be like a long lost cousin. They could be better. They could be worse. It is unpredictable. If you are a plant breeder, F2 is very exciting because every seed in there is going to make something a little different. But when you're a seed saver, it's very confusing and frustrating when you don't know what your seeds are going to grow. Here's a good example. Sweet corn. A lot of the sweet corn we eat here in the United States is hybridized. And the pro here is that hybrid sweet corn stays sweet for a really long time after it comes off the plant. Cool. If you save the seeds from the F1, hybridize sweet corn, and plant them again next year to produce the F2, what you don't realize is that the gene that causes corn to be sweet is a recessive gene. So that means that second generation plant, about 20% that it's going to be a sweet, sweet corn. That's 80% odds that it won't produce a sweet corn at all because of the way the genetics work. How frustrating would that be, right? So when you're a new seed saver, you want to stick with open pollinated plants. You'll see it labeled right on the seed packet, OP. OP is what it'll say right on there. Some seed companies, I'll mention Baker Creek again, exclusively only offer open pollinated seeds. So you can grow them, you can save them, you can share them, and they come back true to type, meaning you can predict what they're going to grow. How about heirloom? We hear that word a lot. What is an heirloom? In the seed saving world, an heirloom is a seed that has been saved and passed down for 50 years or more. Once you hit 50, you're an heirloom. That's the benchmark. I'm on my way to being an heirloom soon. Pretty stoked about that, right? Does the seed need to be an heirloom to save it and share it? No. Open pollinate them. There's new open pollinated varieties that come out every year, right? Wonderful. You can save them. They're great. But man, if somebody's been saving a seed and sharing it for 50 years or more, might be a good reason we'd want to consider saving it too, you know? Uh, it could be sentimental. Oh, my family's always grown this. I was down in Pikeville, Kentucky for a seed swap. I met a little old lady. Her name was Bunny Ashby. Bunny. She was adorable. And Bunny Ashby had a bean. Her family had been growing in their holler in Pike County, Kentucky for over 100 years. That's cool, right? That's a good reason to save that seed. Could be historic. Uh, we have a squash that we grow that is said to have been grown by Abraham Lincoln. You can't really prove that. Um, sounds cool, you know. Um, we were down at the Boyhood Holman Museum, though, that they have down in Indiana, and we found paperwork describing some of the stuff from their garden, and there's a word-for-word -word description of a squash that the Lincoln family grew that I'm telling you, it describes the squash that I got. That's close enough for me. I'm saving those seeds, right? It could just be the tastiest tomato you've ever had, the most beautiful flower you've ever seen, the most fragrant herb. It doesn't matter what it is. Those are good reasons to save those seeds and share them with your friends. Oh, organic and genetically modified, we do not have time to unpack any of that. That's a big topic. People get really emotional about that. We're not going to get into that too much. Um, but I will say one thing about it. And now, for the sake of argument, I'm just going to say that everybody in this room plans on growing organically in your gardens. If you don't, shh, shh, just for now, everybody's growing organically, okay? And by organic, I mean grown with uh, nature-based inputs, inputs that occur naturally on their own. The opposite of this is synthetic, man-made chemicals. And crops that are grown with synthetic chemicals are known as conventional crops. So you've got organic crops, you've got conventional crops. And we're not unpacking the differences here or the pros and cons. But plants adapt to their environment specifically to create seeds. That's all they want to do. Okay. So if you want to grow organically in your garden, but you start with seeds that were grown conventionally, these are seeds that have adapted to synthetic inputs. 
And if you take them home to your garden and not provide them with, with the synthetic inputs that they have adapted to, they're not going to do as well as you want them to. Simple. Simple science. Okay? So if you want to grow organically, give yourself a head start, start with organic seed. And I don't mean certified organic seed. Yet another conversation we don't have time to get into, because that's a big one. If you were to buy seeds from Small House Farm off of my website, everything that I sell is grown organically. But I am not certified organic. I am not legally allowed to use the word organic to describe my products on my website because I won't pay for the sticker. Okay? Just like we like to go to our farmer's market to meet our farmers to see how our food is grown, it's just as important that we know how our seeds are grown. Where do our seeds come from? Local food, everybody's hot on local food right now, but food is only as local as the seed that it grows from. Local seeds grow local food. Let's talk about how our seeds are made now. Many of our crops are annuals, which means they live their entire life cycle. Flowers, fruits, and seeds the very first year that they grow. Other crops are biennials, two years. They need to be overwintered, vernalized is what it's called, and in the second year they produce their seeds. We also need to understand how our plants are being pollinated. Many of our garden crops are self-pollinating. What this means is that they have perfect flowers, all right? Um, you could say hermaphrodites, right? They've got male and female parts right on the same flower. Or we could use different lingo. We could say staminate and pistillate. Or we could just talk about function. Pollen shedding and pollen receptive parts, all on that one flower. Completely self-contained, does all of its thing that needs to make seeds. Other plants separate staminate and pistillate, pollen shedding and pollen receptive flowers. And it takes wind or insects to move pollen from this flower over to this flower to get a fruit to grow. We need to understand this, okay? As seed savers, sometimes we have to get involved in that process, whether it be just in our simple planning, which we're going to talk about, or sometimes we have to actively be a part of pollination. And that's lots of fun. But also, maybe we should just know how our food grows. Even if you're not going to save the seeds, just understanding what's happening out there, that's probably good for us too. Like I mentioned earlier, I travel to a lot of places. This is the 60th presentation I have given so far this year. I go all over the country to talk to people about plants. I go lots of places. I meet lots of people. And one common thread amongst every community is most people don't understand where food comes from. Right? The younger they are, the less they seem to know about it, right? We just keep getting further and further removed from that food system. So even if we could just understand how the food is growing, I think that that's good for us. Quick side story. A couple years ago, I had a photographer get a hold of me. He was working for this magazine, and he was on assignment to get pictures of colorful corn for the cover of a magazine. And through the grapevine, he had caught wind of me. And he called me up. He said, I heard you're the guy for this job. I got this, this assignment. And I said, I'm the guy for the job. I happen to have this, this beautiful Peruvian corn at my house that somebody brought over. It was gorgeous. And I was going to come take pictures of this corn. So this guy came to my little house, which is essentially one room, and set up his uh, big lights. And he had this big camera. And it was quite a production. It was, it was pretty unreal. And he's taking pictures of the corn. And at one point, he stops. And he says, oh, this is wild. This is wild. These, these seeds you got, they look just like corn kernels. I thought about that. What in the world? And he was serious about it, you know? And at first I was like, get out of town. But then I thought, well, you know, let's give him some grace. I don't understand his lights and his camera. I'm up to my elbows in seeds all day, so sometimes I just take things for granted. Everybody should know this, right? But then I thought about it a little more. This guy eats food and lives in the United States. And you're hard-pressed to eat three meals in the United States without at least one of them involving corn in some shape or form. Remember, they're even in our candy bars, right? So this guy eats corn every single day of his life, doesn't even know what the seeds look like. That's where we're at, you know? So even if you're not looking to save the seeds specifically, just understanding how they're produced and where they come from, learn it. And then tell the person sitting next to you, and slowly we can make the world a better place. Here you go. Here's the list. These are your self-pollinating annuals. I've curated the easiest list of all things to save seeds from that are food crops in your garden. Self-pollinating, perfect flowers. Annuals, they produce the first year that you grow them. Uh, this is arranged from the absolute easiest things. So easy, my 14-year-old son does these. I don't even mess with these on the farm anymore. Down to still incredibly easy, but there's like two extra steps we need to learn. When we are done today, you will know everything you've ever wanted to know about the plants on this list, more than you've ever wanted to know. Things you didn't even know were possible on this list right here. So let's break it down. We start with uh, beans and peas. You can see I've also added peas, garbanzo, and soy to this list, although not as 
common in the home garden. You can certainly grow all of these. And the reason they're on the same list is because these are all plants from the same family, Fabiaceae. And what that means is that they all have similar flower structures. What that means is they all make seeds in the same way. And what that means is that when you can learn how to save seeds from one thing on this list, now you know how to save seeds from everything on this list because it's exactly the same. Let's walk through growing some beans. You grow some beans, you pick them, you eat them, you love them, it's great. Eventually, if you don't pick them in time, you start to see the shape of the beans start to form on the pods, right? You leave them a little bit longer and that gets very pronounced, that shape. And then the pods start to turn kind of yellowy and they get a little leathery. And then the leaves on the plant will start to turn yellow and fall off. These are all signals that those fruits, the beans, are starting to mature. The plant will literally drop all of its leaves and put all of its energy into seed production. You literally leave them there. Don't touch them, don't sing songs, don't water them, don't do anything for them, just let them dry down on the plant. Now what you're gonna find is gonna happen. Once your pods have reached that leathery, wrinkly stage, they're no longer waterproof, and your beans are susceptible to damage from moisture. And here in Michigan, it could rain, snow, freeze, sleet, or hail at any given moment. So if that's about to happen and your beans are wrinkly, you got to get them out of there. If you leave them out there, they're going to go wet, and those beans will start to sprout right inside those pods. Take them off. You can literally just pull bean pods off by hand. Once they've reached that stage of yellow, they are far enough along in their maturity that you can take them off the plant, and they will dry down, finish drying in a different environment. So pick them off. Put them in the garage, put them in the kitchen, put them in the hoop house, whatever you got. In a dry place, out of the direct sun, put a fan on them maybe. I pull my whole bean plant right out of the ground, roots and all, and I'll hang them up in the rafters of my barn. And I'll put a fan on them and I'll leave them be. And they are perfectly fine. I've pulled beans in October and not even looked at them again until February. They're fine. As long as they got a little airflow, they're good to go. And they'll get dry and brown and crispy. And that's what we're looking for. So now once they're all dry and brown and crispy, we have to process them. Uh, we're gonna use some fancy agricultural terms here, thresh and winnow. Now to thresh simply means to impact a seed pod to get it to release its seed, right? So while we're specifically talking about beans right now, what I'm sharing with you is general information for all dry seeds. We're gonna define our seeds into two more categories, dry and wet. A dry seed is dry when it's mature, like the beans that we talked about, most of your flower herbs, they turn brown and crispy to signify that they're ready. Wet seeds, on the other hand, think about the inside of a melon. It's wet. Wet seed. We'll get to those in a second. So what I'm telling you here is about all dry seeds, but we're talking about beans specifically. We're going to impact them to get them to release their seeds. Now, with beans, you can just do it by hand. Shelling them by hand. That's a good time. Have your friends over, pour some drinks. Everybody's shelling beans, telling stories. This is good living, right? Fun. Now, if you've got lots and lots of beans, or... If your friends have caught on and they stop coming over to shell your beans, which will happen eventually, uh, it's okay. We can load all of our beans into, say, a bucket and beat it with a stick. Uh, the technical term would be a flail. I use a baseball bat. Put all of your dried seeds into this bucket and beat them with a baseball bat. The exact same motion for when you're churning butter. I'm sure you guys have all churned butter, right? Get it. That's all you got to do. You're not going to hurt the seeds. Okay, those seeds are rock hard, number one, and two, with all the bits of the pod and debris in there, there's enough cushion, you're not going to hurt them. You're just impacting them just to get them to pop open. They're designed to pop open. It's not very hard to do. If you don't have a bucket, you could put them in a pillowcase, hit it like a pinata. You could put them uh, out on tarps, have a dance party. doesn't matter. Or you're just trying to break them open, right? Regardless of your technique, at the end, you're going to have a bunch of beans and seeds and, and leaves and pods and all a mess all together, right? So we're going to move on to winnow. Winnow means utilizing the wind to separate the seed from the chaff, right? That's all we got to do. Now, you can see the lady in this picture here. She's literally using the wind. She's pouring the stuff, and the wind is blowing the chaff away while the heavier seeds fall down below. I'm going to tell you, out of all the dry seeds you're going to work with, 100% of every dry seed you will ever encounter in your seed-saving career, the seed weighs more than the chaff every time. Nature has designed it that way specifically, okay? Big seed, big wind. Small seed, small wind, right? Just blowing that chaff away, the heavier seeds fall below. Now where I'm at, uh, in Sanford, the wind is not as cooperative as it is for this lady in this illustration. So I use a box fan. I'll put a box fan on a table, put a tub down below, turn on that box fan, pour all my stuff. Debris blows, seeds collect. Super simple. Again, small seeds, small wind. Big seeds, big wind, right? Box fan's nice because you can adjust the wind. Very, very nice. 
Then you're going to package your seeds up, and we'll talk about packaging options right at the end, and then you're going to label them. Label them. Label them. I'm going to say the word label 100 times. Not right this second, but throughout the presentation. Label. It's so important to label things. When I pull my beans out of the ground and hang them up on the rafters, I put duct tape on the rafter and label it. When things go into a bucket, I label the bucket. I label every step of the way, because I am not going to remember 20 minutes from now what the heck I'm doing. Label stuff. I got enough seeds at home. I don't know what they are, because I thought I'd remember what they were. You know, Tomatoes all look different on the outside, but on the inside, the seeds are all the same. They're all the same. You know, Tomatoes are like people. You know, Essentially, we're all the same on the inside. Let's talk about lettuce. People grow lettuce. We talked about lettuce earlier. Very few people are saving lettuce seed. What a shame. Oh, my gosh. Come on. So, Asteraceae is the plant family here. Looks just like a dandelion. Same plant family as the dandelion. Makes seeds exactly like a dandelion does. Okay? Self-pollinating. These beautiful flowers will open up. Now, when your lettuce gets too hot or too dry, that's when it bolts, right? And the leaves become more bitter. It's a defense mechanism that the plant does to stop predators from eating the plant so it has time to make its seeds. And it works for every predator except for us because people will just pull the plant up and throw it in the compost. But if you leave it be, it will wow you with the show of flowers. Oh, it's incredible. Like I said, they'll get this tall. All these little yellow sunshine flowers, they're gorgeous. Then they'll close up overnight, and just like a dandelion when they open, it's a poof. Cool, right? It's a wind dispersed seed. Super fun. Now, there's a few ways that we can save our lettuce seeds. If you are um, really casual about your gardening, you can just let the poofs blow all over your garden, and it'll plant lettuce all over the place, and you'll have surprise lettuce. You let it happen in the spring, you'll have surprise lettuce in the fall. You'll have surprise lettuce next spring. You'll never know. That's fun, but some people like to be more organized. They want to decide where the seeds go? Fine. Get your pencil sharp. I'm going to tell you exactly how to save lettuce seeds. You'll see it become a poof. The sepal of the flower, the base of the flower, will turn brown and crispy. That's the signal, remember? Brown and crispy is the signal for dry seeds. Once you see that, you're going to get a paper bag. And on the paper bag, you're going to write the name of the lettuce variety, and you're going to write the year that it is. And then you're going to pinch that poof off, and you're going to put it in the paper bag. Done. That's all you got to do. That's it. Oh, what if you want to harvest a lot of seeds? Okay. Once that flower stalk is about three quarters poof, cut that whole thing off. Put it into a big paper bag. Write the name of the lettuce on the paper bag and write the year on it and put it on the shelf. You're done. Next spring, you get that bag down, give it a shake. All the seeds will fall to the bottom of the bag. That's all you got to do. Now, what if you don't want all that pieces of poof in there? That's all right. It's not going to hurt the seeds because they're perfectly dry, but the aesthetics of it people don't enjoy. I sell lettuce seeds. I can't sell people packets with poofs in them, right? I got to get that out of there. But it's okay because it's a wind dispersed seed. That poof is meant to fly. So we're going to thresh. So by taking all of our seeds into a bowl, we're going to thresh them, impacting the seeds to get them to be released, just like this. This is the technique, into a bowl. And then we will winnow them with the smallest amount of breath you've ever produced. I mean, it's got to be small. And all the poofs, they're in your beard, it's hilarious. And you'll have a bowl full of lettuce seeds. So simple. How many lettuce seeds? Let's do the math. Let's say I plant one lettuce plant and I let it go to seed. One plant will produce 30 to 40 flowers. Each flower will produce 12 to 16 seeds. How many seeds can I make from one lettuce plant? That's the correct answer. An incredible amount from one plant with no effort. That's it. No time, no effort. Simple. Lettuce seeds for all of your friends, right? There's no reason that people can't be doing this. Do it. Do it. All right, next one. Let's talk about these guys. Now we're getting a little further down that list, right? So these ones are a little bit more technical. There's a few extra steps that we're going to have to learn. No big deal, really simple, but I'm going to walk you through it. We've got tomatoes and we've got eggplants. Now this is a tomato flower, and I may come back to this in a moment. So let's walk through the uh, anatomy of this flower really quick, just so I can refer to it later and you know what I mean. This cone shape right here, the anther cone. This is the pollen shedding portion of the flower, okay? And the pistil, the pollen receptive, Sticky stigma inside is inside of that cone. So the wind happens, something moves that thing, pollen falls down that cone, onto the stigma, boom, tomato will grow. Got it? All right, we'll come back to that later. The trickiest part about the tomatoes is the extra step. Now, we're lucky because the tomato will signify its ripeness by turning from green to red, 
or orange or yellow or whatever kind of tomato it is, signifying that it's matured. And that's the stage that we eat it at. Perfect. Now, the extra step for a tomato is fermentation. We have to ferment the inside of the tomato to get good seeds. Why in the world would we do that? All right. You know that gelatinous coating that's on every little tomato seed? It has growth inhibitor chemicals in it, specifically designed to stop those seeds from sprouting prematurely. Now, the tomato comes from the southern area of the country we now call Mexico. And most tomatoes back in those days were spread by birds. Birds would eat the small little fruits, digest them, disperse the seeds. And by going through the bird's digestive system, would remove that coating. All right? Also in nature, the tomatoes fall onto the ground, decompose, rotting. And then the new tomato would grow. The problem that we have here is that might happen too soon and winter is going to come. So we have to replicate that process in our gardens. And we don't, I don't, you can do whatever you want, but I don't want to do it like the birds. So we've made a different way of doing it. You're going to take your ripe tomato, just like this, and you're going to cut it at the equator, right? Not the stem, not the blossom, but in between the two, just like you see in that picture here, to give you access to all those chambers. And you're going to squeeze all the seeds and guts and juice and all that stuff into a mason jar, spaghetti sauce jar, any kind of jar, add a little water to it, put it on the windowsill to ferment. It'll rot, right? It's going to be about two to three days. Now, the variables here are going to be the sugar content of that particular tomato, the heat and humidity of your home, whatever it might be. Two to three days on average. Now, I'm going to recommend covering this thing, because like, all the fruit flies in town are coming to check it out, for sure. But it's got to breathe, because it produces gas while it rots, right? So uh, cheesecloth is really nice. Coffee filter with the rubber band to hold it in place, that's good. I've used saran wrap and then just poked a couple holes in it with a toothpick. Works. Label it, window cell. Two to three days it's going to sit up there. You'll know that it's ready when you see, oh, is what the, well, I guess we're just going to have to imagine it. You'll know that it's ready because you'll see a white scum start to form at the top of the water, right? And when you see the white scum start to form, that's the signal of proper fermentation, that mold that grows on it. At that stage, you're going to add a little bit more water to it, shake it up. And it'll separate like magic. To the top, all of the tomato, all the immature seeds, all the growth inhibitor chemicals, any seed-borne pathogens that might have been in your tomato crop, the disease, all float. And to the bottom of the jar settles nothing but good, healthy, viable tomato seed. Right, separate. So you dump the stuff off the top, the can, you know, goes bloop, and it stinks. And then you take the good stuff, pour it into a little screen, rinse it out, set it out to dry. Now, I like to use paper plates to dry my seeds on. Paper plates work really well because don't, things don't stick too bad. You can break them loose really nice. Um, but what I love about paper plates is you can label them. You can write right on the plate exactly what it is. And when you're done, you can scribble that out and write the next one. I got paper plates. They got words and circles all the way around them. I've used them for years, these same plates. Scribble it out, write the new one. You're going to leave your seeds to dry for 7 to 10 days. Okay. Uh, when you think your seeds are dry, leave them for 2 more days. They're not as dry as you think they are. Right? Um, they might look dry, they might feel dry, but if there's still moisture inside when you package them up, they're going to molt, right? So just let them be. If 10 days comes and goes and you're nervous about it, two more days, 12 days, you're still nervous, 14 days, 21 days, it's okay. Once the seeds are dry and dormant, they are fine to sit there. Let it go long. But you put them away too soon and you're going to ruin them. And you've done a lot of work up to this stage. So just relax. Just relax. They're going to be fine. Let it wait. Let it wait. Let's talk about eggplant. Now, first thing to know about eggplants is we eat them before they are mature. This eggplant here does not have as many viable seeds in it as we would want. You have to let it mature on the plant and it'll get yellow and brown and mushy and bitter and oh, it's a sad looking thing, but that's how you get the good seeds out of it. So you gotta leave a couple eggplants behind. Not a lot. How many seeds are in an eggplant, right? 400. There's a lot of them in there, but they're all dispersed all through that fruit, right? Blue. And that would be. So here's the ticket, the easiest way to get the seeds out of an eggplant. Ready? When your eggplant's mature, you're going to bring it in, you're going to cut it up into small pieces, just dice it into cubes, throw it into a food processor, use the plastic dough blade. That's the ticket to the whole trick here. Plastic dough blade, chunks of eggplant, quarter cup of water, run it, right? I mean 30 seconds. That plastic blade is going to knock all those pieces of fruit around in that water and all the seeds just come right out of it. Okay? If you use the metal blade, you're going to create a slurry. You don't want that. Plastic blade, thump it around, seeds come out. Then you take a screen, set the screen over a bowl, pour the stuff. Chunks of eggplant stay above, seeds fall below, and you've got 400 eggplant seeds in a bowl in 30 seconds time. 
300 eggplants. Who's growing that many eggplants? We could all grow eggplants with that, right? From one fruit, 30 seconds of work. Man, that's nice. Now, one thing that we need to understand about the eggplant is that although it is a self-pollinating plant, it has a very open and beautiful flower. Now, remember the tomato flower that we talked about with that cone that protects the pollen receptive portion? The eggplant flower does not have that. It's wide open. And if you're growing more than one variety of eggplant, insects will cross-pollinate your eggplants. Okay? So that's going to happen. So we need to have a couple workarounds for this so we can get true to type C. Right? Okay. Easiest, only grow one type of eggplant. Problem solved. What if you want more than one eggplant? Okay, I want more than one eggplant, so I can totally feel that. This, Solana melagena. This is an eggplant that was domesticated in Asia. This is your common eggplant. You go to the grocery store and get an eggplant. This is the species that you're going to get. At almost the exact same time that they domesticated this fruit in Asia, over in Africa, they domesticated Solanum aethiopicum. It's a different eggplant. It's green that turns orange when it ripens. I love them. They're great. What I love the most about them is they're different species. Remember how I said when we talked about hybrids, two plants of the same species cross-pollinate to create that first generation. Two plants of the same species, that's the key. Plants of different species are far less likely to cross-pollinate. So I can grow Solanum melangena and Solanum aethiopicum, both eggplants, different species, they won't cross-pollinate. So I can have all that diversity, all that true to type seed, no worry at all. Nice. But what if you want to grow all the purple eggplant? I do. I like these big ones for making ratatouille. I got this one from China. It's really long and skinny. I like to put it on the grill. Or what if you're growing in a community garden? You have no control over what everybody else is doing, right? So if people are growing different varieties of the same species, what do we do? Bag the blossoms. You can get these little organza bags from dollar stores and wedding supply places and all sorts of stuff. And you put it over top of the flower. And what we're doing here is we're creating a barrier to stop insects from bringing pollen from the wrong side of the tracks and we know that this is a self-pollinating flower, it will produce a fruit right in that bag. It needs no outside inputs. And once you see the fruit start to form, you can take off the bag. It's totally safe. Mark that part of the plant with the big colorful twine. Bada bing, you're in business. Or you can get these very large bags, right? Put it over top of an entire plant. So I know that every fruit on that whole plant is true to type. You can buy these big bags online if you want, or you can go to your local hardware store and they sell a thing called paint strainer bags. And I'm not familiar enough with paint to understand why you would ever need to strain it. I don't know what that is, but they're perfect for putting over top of these plants and creating these barriers. If you're on a larger scale and you're growing a whole row of the same variety, row cover. That's all you gotta do. You're just trying to keep insects from getting in there. The plants will produce fruits all on their own. No problem at all. How about peppers? First thing we should note is that there's a multitude of different species of peppers. And not everybody seems to know that. Um, why would you, I suppose, unless you're trying to save seeds? But unfortunately, many of the peppers that we want to grow in our garden all fall under that same species. And pepper flowers are similar to eggplant flowers in the fact that they're open. They can get cross-pollinated, right? And if you grow, say, hot peppers and sweet peppers near each other and they get cross-pollinated, next year all you have is hot peppers now. Remember how sweet is a recessive gene? That's in every plant. Right? So, those bags, those blossom bags, will come in handy with our peppers as well. Another thing to note about our peppers, you cannot save seeds from a green bell pepper. A green bell pepper is an unripe red pepper. It will turn colors to signify ripeness. Green to a color. Yellow, orange, red, depending on the variety. So you have to wait for them to mature. Now, let's walk through how to save pepper seeds. And then we'll talk about hot peppers specifically. Let's talk about pepper seeds. Once your pepper is ripe, you're going to cut it open. You're going to get a paper plate. You're going to take the seeds out of the pepper. You're going to put them on the paper plate. You're going to label it. That's all the steps. Okay? That's how easy it is. And I'm mentioning this even though it's so simple so we can realize how simple it is. Think about every time you cook with the bell pepper in the kitchen. What do you do? Cut it open and take the seeds out of it. You're already doing it. You're just not thinking about it as seed saving. You're discarding the seeds instead of saving them. Seed saving and cooking are the same to me. They overlap. Seed saving is a culinary thing. Think of how many times you encounter seeds in the kitchen. Right? Just change your perspective a little bit. 
seed saving. All right? Now let's talk about hot peppers. Hot peppers have a chemical in them called capsaicin. And capsaicin is what causes the pepper to be spicy. Most of the capsaicin in the pepper is contained within the white membrane inside of the fruit, the part that holds onto the seeds, the part you're going to touch when you take the seeds out. So if you're dealing with hot peppers, wear gloves, please. If you're not wearing gloves and you get the capsaicin on your fingers and you touch yourself in your eyes or your nose or use your imagination, it is a bad scene, okay? And you don't want that. It's not as cool as it sounds. Not at all. I know everybody wants to live a thrilling life, but that's not the thrill you want. Um, so please wear gloves. If you choose to not wear gloves and you burn yourself, use milk. You know, just like how you could, if you eat spicy food, you can drink milk, it helps more than drinking water would. It's because capsaicin is fat soluble. The fat molecules in the milk absorb the capsaicin and take it away. So wash your hands with milk, oil, butter, anything fat based is going to be way more. Wash your hands with soap and water and then go to the bathroom, you'll be like, ah, oh, I should have listened. Should have used the milk. I'm telling you what. But you can skip all that and just wear gloves. Let's talk about these guys just a little bit. Now, mostly I'm going to talk about melons and squash. Now, these are plants, again, that have separate male and female plants that need insects or wind to move pollen from here to there to make the fruit, okay? Um, let's dig into this a little bit. <sighs> Cucubita pepo, Cucubita maxa, Cucubita moshata. Now, these are the three main species of squash that you're going to encounter. And this is an important thing for us to understand is that there's different species of squash. So let's break down the whole thing into a... Uh, we've got Cucurtabaceae which is the plant family, right? And then we could generally talk about squash, which is cucurbita, right? Then we could get more specific and talk about species. Cucurbita pepo, cucurbita maxima, cucurbita moshata. Butternut squash, winter storage squashes, acorn squashes, summer squashes, zucchinis. These are all different species, right? So when you're looking at your plant labels, when you're deciding your plants, the first word determines the genus. That's okay. The second word determines the species. If the first and second word are the same, they are the same species. They will cross-pollinate. All right? The first word is the same and the second word is different, like you see here, different species. They will not cross-pollinate. You can grow a zucchini, a hubbard, and a butternut, and they will not cross-pollinate because they're different species. We need to understand that when we're planting our gardens, the Latin binomials, the scientific names of our plants, so we can avoid cross-pollination. Because these are all plants that are pollinated by insects. They have separate male and female flowers. And we cannot control what those insects do. They will visit all of the flowers in the garden. So we have to make sure that the flowers that they visit are the ones that we want them to visit by understanding the Latin binomials of the plant. Does that make sense? Understanding the species. Both words are the same, same species. Here's a great example. How about cucumis? Now, we're in the same family, cucumis, sativus, Cucumbers. All of the cucumbers in the world are the same species. Cucumis melo is your cantaloupes, honeydews, and muskmelons, right? See, it's the same first word, different second word. Cucumbers and melons will not cross-pollinate. Cucumber and cucumber will cross-pollinate, right? So Trellis linatus, that's your watermelons, and Langanaria is your decorative gourds, birdhouse gourds, and that sort of thing. So from the top, you can grow a zucchini, a hubbard, a butternut, a cucumber, a cantaloupe, a watermelon, and a birdhouse gourd all together in a pile. Vines intertwined, flowers touching, regular old party out there, and no cross-pollination will happen. So that is a lot of diversity for your garden, for your dinner table, true to type seeds to share with your community, no work at all. It's pretty cool, right? It's just understanding how these plants are working in the garden and then working with them. Melons. Now, when melons, cucumbers, nope, melons, sorry, I almost went to the next slide in my head. When melons are ripe is the stage that we eat them, right? Which is nice for us. And we're already doing this in the kitchen as well. Let's walk through the stages of eating a melon. So the first step is identifying a ripe melon, right? Some people like to sniff them. Some people like to thump them. Doesn't matter. You can be a sniffer or a thumper. Either way, you identify the ripe melon, and then what's step number two? Cut it open. What's step number three? Scoop out the seeds. Now, at this stage in your life, what are you doing with those seeds? Putting them in your compost? Giving them to your chickens? I don't know. What if you rinsed them off and put them out to dry? 
seed saving. All right? Again, it's just a matter of slightly changing your perspective, just a little bit. And you'll see that we're already doing 95% of the work that we need to do to be a seed saver. We just have to see it in a different way. Cucumbers, we talked about them, those thin translucent seeds. They need to mature. That's where we're going to get our seeds from. How about watermelons? Watermelons, when they are ripe, is the stage that we eat them and the seeds are mature. And again, we've been doing this our entire lives. You're eating a watermelon, you get a seed in your mouth, what do you do? Spit it into a bucket. Bam, seed saving, right? It's oversimplified. You're going to want to wash it off, get the sugars off of it, and put it out to dry. But you know what I'm saying? We're already doing it. I was raised by my grandmother, and my grandmother taught me that if I swallowed a watermelon seed, that it would grow a watermelon inside of me. You guys familiar with this? I'm telling you what, I took that to I was like scared of it. I took it so serious, I could have probably gotten counseling. Um, it, really, it really bothered me a lot. I was so nervous about it. There was a period of my life where I wouldn't even eat watermelons for the fear of accidentally swallowing a seed. As an adult, I have learned that number one, watermelon seeds are not going to grow inside of you. Number two, they're completely edible. And number three, they are the most nutritious part of the entire plant is the seed that it produces. And I grew up scared to death of them. Just the slightest change in our perspective, what an impact it could have, right? That's one of the beautiful things about seed saving is it helps us see things from a different point of view. Watermelon. Those are all wet seeds that are inside of wet fruits, and they should all be processed as such. Now we're going to remove them from the fruit. We're going to add them to water. Fermentive needed. Now, let's break this down a little bit. Fermentive needed. We talked about fermenting our tomatoes. I also ferment my cucumbers. Similar gelatinous coating on a cucumber. I'm going to ferment those guys as well. I will also soak tomatillos, ground cherries, potato berries, sometimes even cherry tomatoes. Not necessarily because they need that fermentation process, but because it helps break down the plant material to release the seeds. Take a bunch of tomatillos, smash them, put them in some water. The seeds will sink. The pieces of fruit will float. Nature will do the work for you. Same thing with the squash. You know you got a stringy clingy and a squash trying to grab the seeds? Scoop it all out, throw it in a bucket of water, let it sit. All the pieces of fruit will float and all the seeds will sink. All the mature seeds will sink. That's the thing. You can take all of your seeds, your wet seeds, and put them in water. An immature seed whose embryo has yet to fully develop inside will have air pockets in it, which will cause those seeds to float. Nine times out of ten, if a seed floats, it's not going to grow. Seed sinks. That's the one you want. You're going to drop them like we talked about, and you're going to package them up, and then you're going to... Yeah, there you go. Let's touch on these guys right quick. I don't want to talk too much about these because many of our brassicas are biennials, which means they take two years to make seeds, and I don't want to confuse you with that process. But the seed pod here is called Salix, and I love to say the word Salix, so I put the slide up here so I can say Salix a few times before we move along. These Salix, as you see here, um, their, their dispersal mechanism is to shatter break open and drop those seeds, okay? They get brown. The slightest touch, and these things will just poof, and drop all the seeds. This one stalk that you're looking at here has about 2,500 seeds on it, and it will drop 2,500 seeds in one spot. You'll have kale in that spot for the rest of your life. You will sell your house. The next guy moves in. He's got kale in that spot for the rest of his life. So we want to avoid that. When they are yellow, as you see here, if they are far enough along, just like our beans, right? Cut that thing, put it in a bucket somewhere, let it sit. It'll continue to dry down. And then when you're ready for it, just bang it on the inside of the bucket, 2,500 seeds will come out of it. 2,500 seeds. That's a lot. Now, we're not going to get into vernalization, the overwintering process. Well, that's a little too in-depth. We're not going to get into that. But I do want to say this, and this is why brassicas are the most important thing for us to talk about right here. Cauliflower, broccoli, kale, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, cabbages, so say collard greens right here, but it doesn't, are all the same plant. They're all the same species. They all come from the same wild mustard. All right? Different people in different places historically observed the wild mustard growing around them and saw abnormalities inside of the population. Some of those plants had swollen stems. Some of them plants had bigger leaves. Some of them had sweet flower buds, right? And people said, oh, that's interesting. So they saved the seeds from those particular plants and intentionally planted them and watched them and saw some of those same traits happen again. Saved those seeds, planted them. 
saw the traits, saved those seeds, planted them, da-da-da-da-da, fast forward a thousand years of that, and they produced what we consider to be completely different vegetables, all from the same plant, right? That's the power of seed saving. Now, this is an extreme example, of course, who's got a thousand years, but this is what we do every time we're in our gardens selecting seeds. When you select for particular traits, you'll get those traits. If I was to give each and every one of you seeds for Amish paste tomatoes today, we talked about Amish paste tomatoes, right? And I give you all the seeds and you go home and you grow them. And in just 10 years, 10 short years, we all get back together and bring our tomatoes with us. Each and every one of us will have a distinctly different tomato that we return with. Different. Because we're all going to select for something different. You might like the biggest tomatoes. You might like early tomatoes. You might like disease resistance. You might find an interesting shape. It doesn't matter. We have different growing conditions. We have different soil, different microclimates, different growing techniques. There's just enough variables at play. And all these plants want to do is make the best seeds they can. They quickly adapt to their environment, producing different tomatoes. Every time we save and share our seeds, it's that significant. We want to make sure we store our seeds well. Cool, dark, and dry. These are the things that we're looking for. Cool, dark, and dry. Now, I've got these sweet airtight containers right here. This is great for a photo. This is not enough seeds to be practical in any way for anybody, but it's a nice photo. I say use an airtight container if you're looking for long-term storage. If you're putting seeds in the freezer, it's got to be an airtight container. You know what I mean? But if you're just storing your seeds from now until next season, cool, dark, and dry is all that matters. You go to your seed library, you're going to see they come in coin envelopes. That's perfectly fine. As long as it is cool, dark, and dry. Keep it in a cupboard, a closet, a place where there's not fluctuations in temperature. Do not put your seeds in your refrigerator. All right? You see a lot of people doing that, storing their seeds in their refrigerator. You're opening and closing that refrigerator so often, the fluctuations in temperature and humidity inside of that box, not good for seed storage. If you have a refrigerator you're not using, I guess. But a cool, dark, dry place is better. You put seeds in the freezer, they will last longer than all of us. All, okay, I'm telling you. I was down in Kentucky again for a seed swap, and I had a little kid come up to me, and he says, hey, mister, I got these seeds out of the back of my grandma's freezer. You think you want them? And I was like, yes, I do, you know. So I got them. It was 10 tomato seeds. And after we looked into it and talked to this family, they had been in the back of this lady's freezer for 65 years. 65 years, 10 tomato seeds, seven of them grew. 70% germination from seeds that were in a freezer for 10 years, or for 65 years. That's crazy, right? Very cool. But the best place to store our seeds is in the soil. Continue to plant your seeds. Select and save your seeds. That's the most important thing that we can do. The climate and the world that we live in today is much different than it was 65 years ago. Have you been outside today? It's a little different today than it was 65 years ago, right? Keep planting, and saving, and sharing your seeds. When you want to have a, oh, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. And that's it for me. Here's a quick uh, example for the labels. Uh, this is what Seed Savers Exchange recommends on a label, right? You want to have nice information on your label. Uh, the scientific name, that Latin binomial, that's key to come back to, right, when we're planting our squashes and that sort of thing. Um, so we understand what plants that we're working with. As much information as you can put on a label is going to benefit not only yourself, but all the people you share those seeds with too, right? All right, now you guys can applaud. We're at the end of the presentation. If you're interested in any of my books, I've got them here with me today. Uh, saving Our Seeds is going to walk you through saving seeds from 43 different species. If you're interested in growing and foraging herbs for food and medicine, i got a book on that. If you want to cold press your own seed and nut oils, and you totally should, i got a book on that. If you buy any two books, you get this book of seed stories absolutely for free. It's full of stories from seed keepers I've met traveling around. And this book here is so new, it's not even on the slide. This just came out in April, Grow Great Vegetables in Michigan. It is a month-by-month -month guide to growing the greatest vegetables you've ever grown in the great state of Michigan. We can do cards and checks and cash and high fives and all the things. Um, and uh, if you want to join our mailing list, i got a thing for that over there too. That's absolutely for free. And if you want to stay in touch with me after today, there's all the links. The Facebook, Instagram, our YouTube channel if you want to see us gardening, our Patreon if you want to subscribe and get groovy things mailed to you every month, um, and the website. All those things are also on these cards that we have over here. And there's coupon codes if you would like to um, purchase things off. Give you a discount. Everyone loves a good discount. And for the folks of you at home, of course, you can always visit the website, smallhousefarm.com. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's been a blast. <laughs> Yes. Two or three.
three questions. Let's do them. We are at the 